Well, as you know, when you look at the end, uh, or you look at your calendar, you know that the end of this month, we will be celebrating Easter. And so over the next four weeks, obviously starting today, we're going to be looking at certain themes that I think will help us understand and even appreciate to a greater degree what Easter is really all about. Because we know that Easter is more than uh, candy eggs or chocolate bunnies or pastel colors. And to really celebrate this season, I think you really have to focus in on and study some very serious doctrines and themes to have an appreciation for what, uh, for what Easter really is for. And so starting today, we're going to be looking at uh, sin and its consequences. And then moving forward, we're going to be looking at the holiness of God. We'll discuss the crucifixion. And then finally, on Easter Sunday, we're going to be looking at the resurrection. But to get us started, today I want us to read, or you follow along as I read, Genesis chapter 3, which really is talking about the introduction of sin into our world and the consequences of that sin. Now, this is a longer passage than normally I would read on a Sunday morning, but it is a narrative and I want you to see this in its context, and so we are going to read the, the whole chapter. You can follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, you forgot them, the words will appear on the screen behind me. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because... I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman who you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return." Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. (coughs) Excuse me. Before you can really appreciate Easter, 
you have to spend a little time in Genesis chapter 3. In fact, the only reason Easter became necessary is because of what occurred here in the Garden of Eden. Now, Genesis, as you know, starts by showing the, the power and the majesty of God in creation. With only his words, God created all that has ever been created. Hebrews 11 verse 3 puts it this way. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So God spoke and all that we know to exist came into being at his word. The planets, the stars, the water, the air, vegetation, animal life, everything was created by God. And then at the pinnacle of creation, God creates man and woman. And it's interesting, everything that he creates, it follows with a commentary, and it was good. Whatever God created, he finished it off by saying, and it was good. As chapter 2 comes to an end, we have pictured for us the perfect couple living in the ideal location having perfect fellowship with God, communing with God, apparently on a daily basis. And we ask ourselves, well, what could possibly go wrong? Everything is just so perfect. Why would anybody want to change that? And then we come to Genesis chapter 3, where we read that something horribly went wrong and changed man's destiny and his relationship with God completely. John MacArthur Jr. makes this comment. He says, this chapter, speaking of Genesis 3, this chapter may well be the most important chapter in the Bible. Certainly it is true that if you don't understand this chapter, you don't understand the rest of the Bible. You cannot understand the solution to the problem unless you understand the problem. You can't understand the cure unless you understand the diagnosis. You will never be able to understand God's remedy for this world if you don't understand the malady under which this world lives and functions. So we need to spend a little bit of time in Genesis chapter 3 so that we understand what's going on and so we can have a deeper appreciation of what Easter is all about. Now, I think the details of Genesis 3 are fairly well known to most of us. We've heard this story when, uh, when we were very young. And so let me just kind of highlight the main events that are going on here. To begin with, we have the account where Satan misrepresents God's word. You notice what he said to Eve? Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, God didn't say that. It was only one tree that they were forbidden to eat, to eat from. But already, Satan is starting to cause question in the mind of Eve, starting to, to really question the motivation, even the love of God. And then Eve responds. And in Eve's response, I see, a, again, a misrepresentation of God's word. Notice what she says. You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Now, I don't see where God says you couldn't touch it. Probably good advice. You shouldn't be so close that you would actually be tempted to pick the fruit for yourself. But it doesn't say that God said that. And notice what happens next. Satan calls God a liar. Isn't that amazing? He calls God a liar. He says to Eve, you won't die. No, 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 no. I, I, know, I know God said that. He's lying. You're not going to die. And the next thing is Adam and Eve eat the fruit and changes the relationship between God and humans completely. Now, this passage in Genesis never uses the term, but this is the introduction of sin into our world. Deceived by Satan to disobey God, Adam and Eve launched the human race into a 
spiritual downward spiral that nothing but the death of the Son of God would be able to stop. It took the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in order to stop this downward spiral. I think it's hard for us today to, to really understand the, the cataclysmic change that this brought about. Because you and I, in fact, nobody, since the time of Adam and Eve before they sinned, really knows what a world is like without sin. And I'm not too sure we can even imagine that kind of a state. See, everything was impacted by their disobedience. Everything was impacted. Paul, writing in the book of Romans chapter 8, makes this statement. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Isn't that fascinating? Everything that God created, and after he created, said, and it's good. Now that has been tainted by sin. We don't know what a world is like that has not been touched, that has not been tainted, that has not been impacted, affected in some way by sin. Everything has changed because of Adam and Eve's sin. What that meant, or what that means for you and I, is that the entire human race has been infected by this virus, if you would, this spiritual virus that is called sin. See, Adam and Eve, rightfully, represents us, represents mankind. Romans 5, verse 12 says, sin entered the world through one man. See, Adam and Eve's DNA flows through each one of us to the point where every man, woman, and child that is alive today is affected because of sin. Now, I know that some would say, and they would even argue, well, that's really not fair. I mean, why should you and I have to suffer for something that our ancient ancestors, for some some deed that they committed thousands upon thousands of years ago? But if you look at it logically, if a perfect, sinless man and woman living in a perfect environment could not, could not last sin-free within that environment. How could there be any hope for anyone else to live sin-free for themselves? It's an impossibility. See, they represent the best of us. And even the best of us have failed. The best of us have failed. We have sinned. Now, we talk about sin. In fact, we talk about sin a lot in the church But what exactly is sin? If someone was to ask you, define for me sin, how would you define that? It's not as easy as it seems. I quoted John MacArthur Jr. a moment ago. Let me give you his uh, definition of sin. It's pretty good, by the way. He says, sin is any personal lack of conformity to the moral character of God or the law of God then sin is a disposition of the heart. It thinks evil. It speaks evil. It acts evil. And it omits good. John Piper, a name that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, again, another pastor, theologian, this is how he defines it. He says, sinning is any feeling or thought or speech or action that comes from a heart that does not treasure God over all other things. He goes on to say, in the bottom of sin, the root of all sinning is such a heart. 
a heart that prefers anything above God, a heart that does not treasure God over all other person and all other things. And then he says, or as I once tried to express in a message years ago, what is sin? Sin is, and just listen to this list. Sin is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverence, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored. The faithfulness of God not trusted, trusted, the promises of God not believed, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. A moment ago, I, would ask, I asked you, how would you define sin? I probably couldn't come up with such a lofty definition as as these two men here. But we know sin, don't we? We know it all too well. We see it in ourselves. We see it in others. We see it in the world around us. Our definition may not be as these theologians have defined it, but we know what sin is. Our problem is we know what sin is so well we may even fail to recognize it. We're so familiar with it. We're so used to it. In fact, can I say we're so comfortable with sin that we may fail to recognize that it really is sin. See, sin is not only what evil men do, like, oh, we think of the mafia types, the criminals, or those dictators who rule their countries and then they try to to rule the world as well. You and I are familiar with sin on on a much more personal level. It is sin that causes us to lose our temper when things don't go our way. When we want something and we don't get it and we get angry. That's the presence of sin. It's often the source of our angry words, selfish conduct, our self centered outlook. It is sin that causes the young man and the young woman to desire the pleasures of a sexual relation before marriage. That is sin. It is sin that causes the married man or the married woman to look outside their marriage for companionship. That is sin. Sin is seed in the greed that at times seems to control or dominate our economy that puts material things even before people. Sin is what causes substance abuse that breaks up families, that takes advantages of others. We may not be able to define sin, but we know it. We see it in ourselves. We see it in others. We can describe it. And we could go on and on. I mean, the list is almost endless. But the point here is all sin originated when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. It was at that point in time that sin was introduced into our world and which you and I, even today, have to deal with in some way. Now, the real tragedy, of course, and I think you know this, are the consequences that resulted from sin. What was the result of sin? Well, lo and behold, God was right, wasn't he? In a word, you could summarize it. It's death. That was the consequences of sin. That's exactly what God said was going to happen. Satan called him a liar, but God wasn't lying. The consequences of sin is death. Now, at one level, we would say that this is talking about physical death, and and I do believe that is true to, to a degree. It would appear that physical death was the result of sin, and I don't fully understand that, whether or not if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, their descendants were just going to live on this perfect world forever and ever and ever. I, I don't understand that, but It does seem to imply here, as well as in other portions of Scripture, 
that physical death is actually the result of sin. But that's not the worst. We think that's the worst. Physical death is not the worst. At a much more serious level, death really means separation from God. Separation from God. That's what Romans 6.23 says. For the wages of sin is death. And I believe it's talking about a spiritual death, separation from God, because the rest of the verse says, comparing it to the first part, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, spiritual separation, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this spiritual death, this spiritual celebration, is actually illustrated in this passage here in Genesis chapter 3. I mean, obviously, Adam and Eve did not die physically. At least not immediately. They lived many more years after this. But they did die spiritually immediately. All of a sudden, they were separated from God. Isn't it interesting, after the fall, God comes back into the garden and he, and he calls for Adam and Eve and they hide themselves. They no longer want to be in the presence of God. The shame of what they have done by sinning has caused them to actually want to avoid being in God's presence. And then, secondly, interesting enough, God banishes them from paradise, from the Garden of Eden. They were no longer permitted to fellowship with God. There was a time they could just come into God's presence. There was nothing hindering them from doing that. And God says, no longer. Things things are going to be different. God's still going to speak to them. God's still going to uh, have a relationship with them. But it's going to be different. Not the way it used to be. See, to be dead spiritually, which is really the tragedy here, the real consequence of sin, means to be forever separated from God. And that is where each of us are at the moment that we are born into this world. And that is where we will remain eternally separated from God unless we accept personally His offer of salvation. That's what we're going to be remembering, by the way, in just a moment's time as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's what that is all about. That's what we're going to delve into in a little bit more detail in the, in the weeks to come as we explore you know, the, what Easter is all about and so on. But for today, let's just say this. Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead so that we could have fellowship with God, so that our relationship with God could actually be restored. See, I would summarize this entire chapter with one sentence. Here's my sentence. Sin may be fun for a season, but it will be hell for eternity. Sin may be fun for a season. In fact, it is fun for a season. But it results in hell for eternity. May God help each and every one of us to realize the seriousness of sin. And the eternal consequences if we choose not to accept his salvation that he offers to us in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Again, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to to think very seriously about this Easter season that we are entering into. And Father, help us to reflect on its cause. Help us to reflect upon the facts of Genesis Genesis chapter 3. And Lord, we pray that we may not only recognize the seriousness of sin, but the way of salvation that is being offered to us in Christ Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.